IVC filters used to prevent strokes are defective and dangerous. The FDA knows it and does nothing about it. See the story at DrugSafetyNews.com. Here with Howard Nations now, and Howard, a few weeks back actually, you and I discussed the product IVC blood filters. Right. And uh, to put it in a nutshell, a small little device that looks like it has several fingers coming off it, implanted uh, inside uh, arteries, to essentially catch blood clots. Right. Uh, we discussed many of the problems with these. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about uh, at the time, and I know new information has emerged since then, is the fact that why would the FDA even put such a device on the market when, when it was obvious that it didn't work and that it had more problems than it solved? Well, it's a very interesting history on the FDA and this product. And unfortunately, it shows how totally inadequate the FDA approach is to clearing products like, like this for sale. In this particular case, the, the permanent filter had been on the market for a number of years. Well, there's a race to get a retrievable filter, one you can actually put in and remove on the market. And the race was between Bard and Cook, who are the two largest manufacturers. So Bard came uh, with a product called the recovery device. Now, in order to beat Cook on the recovery device and get it on the market first, they took a shortcut. Uh, to get a clinical trial done, they went to Canada because it's easier to get this thing done in Canada than it is in the United States. So they went to Canada and they did a 32-person study, a clinical trial. Now, they misled the doctor there because they told the doctor, what we want to do is test retrievability because this is going to be the first retrievable device on the market. So the doctor is doing a retrievability study. That is, he's putting this into 32 patients. He's waiting different periods of time, uh, ranging from five days to 143 days to test the removability of the product without any problems. So he does that, they go through the testing, and during the course of the testing, out of 32 patients, they found 22 tilts, they found one migration and one fracture. So 24 out of 32 uh, of, the, of the patients had a problem. Now they solved the tilting problem, but when it got to the fracture, which is a serious problem, and when it got to the migration, uh, they sort of breezed over it because the doctor was just testing, put it in, take it out. So Bard told the doctor, don't worry about it, we're gonna do longer term tests on this to find out about the migration and the fractures. So then they, they come back to the United States after doing that testing, and they go to the FDA, and they submit to the FDA the product for a 510K approval with only this test supporting it. Now what they had done is they came up with a root cause analysis of what they usually do. On the, on the uh, fracture, they blamed the patient because the patient, this particular product had been, was in a pregnant lady, and she delivered while she had the IVC filter in place. So they said, well, what caused the fracture was the pregnancy with the compressions on delivery of the child. And so they came back, they, they sub set it up for submission, for a 510K submission, uh, with the claim that, well, don't worry about it, we found the cause of the migration, we found the cause of the fracture, We've corrected the tilt problem, so we're all good. So out of, a, out of a case where they had 24 out of 32 problems, they submit that as the only, as the doctor described it, small non-scientific study that was done on this product before they submit it for clearance for sale with the FDA. So 32 people tested only for retrievability. Right. 75%, uh, essentially a 75% failure rate. And they give it to the FDA, FDA says, okay. I mean, is that essentially what, what has happened here? I mean, did anybody at Bard stand up and say, maybe we're doing this wrong? Yeah, it's actually even worse than that because what happened was the 22 problems were corrected, the tilt was corrected, so you left with a migration and a fracture. So there's a woman at Bard, her name is Kay Fuller, and she was the official liaison between Bard and the FDA, and her job was to nurture the F510K submission through the FDA. Well, her job is to make sure that all the information presented to the FDA is, is true and correct. In fact, she has to sign a truth and accuracy statement to that effect. So she goes to the engineering department and the design department and she says, 
I don't buy this whole idea about the pregnancy being the cause or the delivery of the child being the cause of the fracture. I don't think you've done a root cause analysis on the fracture, and I, I can't recommend this to the FDA. So they say, well, you know, that's, this is your job. You just, you just get this done. And so when it comes down to it, she refuses to sign the submission. She said, I'm not going to sign this because I don't believe you've determined the cause of the fracture. Then she refuses to sign the truth and accuracy statement. So what does Bard do? They forge her signature to the submission. So they submit it with her name on it, but she didn't sign it. She also refused to sign the truth and accuracy statement, so they had someone else sign that. Now, to make it even worse, she then calls the FDA. When, they, when she sees what they've done, she calls the FDA before the clearance, and she said, look, i got to tell you, I don't, I don't believe that you need to look closely at this clearance because I don't think the fracture problem has been solved. The FDA said, thanks for calling. Then they proceed to clear it immediately. Immediately, they cleared it for, for uh, uh, sale. And when the sales begin, of course, they have migrations which cause death, and then they have fractures, multiple fractures, Numerous fractures, and among, among all the men that they had the fractures in, not one of them was pregnant. So it <laughs> kind so, of blew their whole theory. Exactly. And so uh, migrations, uh, uh, fractures, all kinds of problems with these. How bad uh, are these individual problems? You know, what... Uh... Well, there's one other, one other thing Bard <laughs> did that, that exacerbated those problems. Anytime you're going to divide... Do, design a product, regardless of what the product is. You consider the environment of use. That's a term of art. You consider the environment of use of the product. What is the environment in which your product has to function? And how will it function in that environment? Bard actually says in an email that we never really, we didn't really understand the full environment uh, where we were going to use this. The environment is the vena cava, which is the largest, the largest vein in the body. And it's a very dynamic area because all the blood flowing from, from the extremities back up to the heart comes upward. It's flowing upstream, so it's, it's, a, it's a hard push. And it comes into the vena cava, and so there's a lot. It's, it's a very turbulent and dynamic vein right there. In addition to that, it sits, it's in the diaphragmatic area, so you have diaphragmatic motion and you have pulmonary motion. So that's a very dynamic area, and that's moving a lot. So you've got this filter that's attached to the interior surfaces of the vena cava, but it's got all this motion all the time. It's in constant motion. They failed to take that into account when they designed the product, if you can imagine that. So, so, so it's essentially like a company saying, okay, we, we've built a new shovel, and then when you put it in dirt, it disintegrates. Say, oh, well, we didn't, we didn't really know how the shovel was going to interact with dirt. Yeah, I mean it's basically the same <laughs> thing. Exactly. And, yeah. I mean that is that is astounding that, you know, and again, we're we're here at Mass Towards Being Perfect, a legal conference. You know, right. you, you're a very successful trial lawyer. This is information that nobody would know if it were not for the work that you and your firm and all of these other trial lawyers do. So I just want to point that out real quick because I, I think that is a, a huge part of this story. I mean these these kinds of things happen all the time with products, especially yeah. medical devices and yeah. pharmaceuticals. And so, you know, that, that's something everybody watching this needs to understand is that it is the work that, that you and your colleagues do that helps to expose this. Um, and so, so thank you for that, absolutely. And so let's, uh, let's continue though. I mean, what, what else? Uh, well, here's what they need to understand. A lot of times you don't know you have this problem. You may have this IVC filter in, you may have perforations, you may have tilting right now uh, and not know it. Uh, until it's too late. Uh, you might have a fracture right now. So let me explain what they are. First of all, they're perforations. And this is where, when the, the, legs of the, uh, the legs of the product attach to the vena cava, the vein. And the perforation is when they go through the, through the vein, perforate the vein itself and stick out on the other side. Uh, Secondly, it's when they go through the veins, stick out on the other side, and come in contact with another, with another organ. Like, uh, and third is a really dangerous one, which is they perforate through the vein, and they stick out on the other side, and they perforate another adjoining organ. 
The adjoining organs, think about this. The adjoining organs are the aorta. Imagine perforating the aorta and you bleed to death. Perforate the bowel, massive contamination in the body. Uh, perforate the spine, there are all sorts of problems like that. And not only that, you don't have just one perforation. Uh, you, we've seen cases where you have four, five, six perforations, six legs sticking out of one, one vein. Wow. Uh, it's treacherous, treacherous, absolutely. And the thing about this, perforations are progressive. So the longer you have men, the, the more active you are, the more you move around, the, the worse they become. And so you may have that in now. You don't know it until it perforates your artery and you bleed to death and they find it on autopsy. That's the scary part. Uh, secondly, you get migration. Migration is where the whole thing comes loose. The legs don't hold it to the vena cava and it, it, the whole thing comes loose and it moves up and blocks the blood flow. You're dead. That's it. Um, the next one is fractures. Fractures is where the, there's a lot of movement in there and the legs can break off. And a lot of these have been in for years. A lot of these were implanted in 2008, 2009, and they're, they're literally, literally a couple of million of them in use right now. And people don't realize, but they, they say, well, I've had this in since 2011. I haven't had any problem at all. Here's the danger. The fracture, average fracture rate where a leg breaks off or an arm breaks off and it's got this sharp point on the end of it, and moves through the bloodstream until it gets to the heart or lungs or some other part of the body. It, the average fracture rate is five and a half years. So if you had this thing put in in 2011, 2012, and you're thinking, well, I've never had any problem with it. Well, that's because the fracture rate, the fracture could be coming tomorrow. Yeah. So you need to actually have a CAT scan where they look at the filter and can see, are all the legs there? Has it fractured? Is it tilting? All these sorts of things. Uh, the, in a fracture case of mine, the, the leg broke off six years after implantation. The lady got off a plane in San Francisco uh, where she was feeling very, very woozy, very uh, shaky, and she said, get me to the hospital immediately. They took her to the hospital. They did open heart surgery immediately. They found that she had lost complete unit of blood, and the doctor lifted, the, lifted her heart with his, with his hands and found a little fracture, a little leg about this long, perforating the pericardium. And she was slowly bleeding through that. If they perforated, that's right next to the heart. It's a sack around the heart. If she had perforated the heart, she would have bled to death. She almost bled to death anyway. She actually flatlined on the table and they brought her back. But so that was six years after it was implanted. Uh, so the, the fractures can be very, uh, very treacherous. And then once you get past fractures, you have the ones that are embedded, which is that they, when they perforate through the vena cava, then tissue uh, grows on the, on the tips that are on the other side, and you get uh, endothelialization, which is the tissue growth. So when you try to take it out, it won't come out because it's, it's got this ball on the end of it, and you can't take it out without tearing the vein. And so it requires surgery there to take it out. And many, many of these are in place now and can't be removed by the normal process. And then you get to the one that's the source of most of the evil, which is tilting. So instead of, uh, instead of sitting straight in the vena cava vein, it, it tilts. So it tilts at an angle like this. So as the blood is flowing up through and it tilts this way, first of all, you can't retrieve it anymore because it has to be sitting st straight to take it out. It tilts this way, and the blood flow comes up through here, and it slows down here. It slows very, very slow in volume, and as it slows down, it starts to form a clot here. It's forming a new clot that didn't exist. It wasn't a clot that moved, for, moved from the, the, the calf or the leg. It's, it's forming a new clot. So this thing is actually prothrombotic, which means that it's forming a clot that wouldn't exist otherwise. It forms a clot, and then that clot breaks loose. It goes to the heart and lungs causes pulmonary embolism. Or it's also, with a tilt, it's also failing. The, the clots are just going right on by over here. So then you get the, maybe one of the worst things you get, when it's tilted like this, and you get this slow uh, blood flow here, and then you get a clot form, and then you get a bigger clot form, and it clots all the way down. It clots the entire vena cava. 
collapse the entire vein. And the answer to you to die from that because you're getting no blood flow to the heart or when they realize it, they have to go in and either do a chemical removal or you have to do a mechanical review, removal. I call it Drano or, or rotor rooter And it's a terrible, terrible treatment to remove all this clot. Out. And that's if you discover it before it kills you. So the, the irony of this is, first of all, they've never proven the efficacy. They've never proved that these things are effective at all. And there's scientific studies on that. There's a, no efficacy to these problems. But then the ultimate irony is that they're creating the exact thing that they're designed to stop. They're creating the, the clots that are turning into pulmonary emboli, which are killing people. And most of these, uh, the fractures you said occur, you know, uh, typically around five and a half years yep. is what they're looking That's at. That's the average fracture rate. So knowing that, what has the FDA or have they done anything, you know, since these, uh, you know, we're, we're back full circle now. This information is now known. So the FDA has to know it. So now what have they done? Well, the FDA finally did something right. They came out with a statement at the urging of the medical society, at the, at the urging of the interventional radiologist, and said, get these things out of your body in 45 to 60 days after, the, after they're implanted, or after you've uh, solved the problem that they're implanted for. Uh, and, and so get them out in 45 to 60 days because long-term indwelling IVCs, the latest study shows that most of the clots that are being formed now that cause the problems are not clots that are formed in DVTs that are moving up. If you had one of these in your body for six, eight years or four years, it's not the clots from the forming in your DVT, your D-vein thrombosis. Now, it's the clots forming around or because of the IVC. The IVC filter itself is prothrombotic and is now the biggest single cause of the clots in, in long indwelling patients. It's a ridiculous situation, but this is what happens when the company misleads the FDA. The, the FDA, despite being warned about it, just says, okay, fine, you're a company, Psh, ship it on through. Sloppy, sloppy, sloppy work at the FDA. Just Ab terrible. Absolutely. And unfortunately, that's kind of become the hallmark of the organization, uh, really going back to the, the George W. Bush years right. when he packed it with uh, you know former employees of Pfizer yeah. and Merck. And unfortunately, to this day, that trend has, has continued. Uh, probably not to as great a degree as it was during George W. Bush, but that revolving door still exists. And as long as it does, unfortunately, I think we're gonna be looking at you know many more problems like this with many more products. And if not for people like you and the trial lawyers here at this seminar, there would be no recovery for the plaintiffs, for the injured victims. So I wanna go ahead and just thank you for all of your work. And I know everyone watching this show uh, also owes you and trial lawyers a debt of gratitude, not just for this, but for so many other uh, cases and products that you have done over the years. So thank you very much and thank you for joining me today. Absolutely, my pleasure. What I would recommend right now is if you have an IVC filter in and you've had it in for some period of time, go back to your doctor, tell your doctor that the, that the FDA says take these things out in 45 to 60 days. Get a CAT scan, see if it's tilting. Are their legs missing off of it? Uh, see, do you have a problem? Because unfortunately, the problems that you have from this don't occur, don't, don't reveal themselves until your death. Absolutely. Howard, thank you very much. My pleasure, friend. Thank you.